is on YouTube. All right. Uh, but it's not quite ready. On so the record, Justin. I know you are. Um, so it'll be here in a second. I'll have to turn the, the mute off, but then that way I can watch the notes. So hopefully people will tune in and have some questions. Um, we'll see. All right. This point on. There you go. Okay. All right. So we are good. So it is one o'clock Eastern on the dot. Let me hit record as a backup. Okay. And we are ready to go. So welcome to another episode of the Advisor of Tomorrow Live. I have my friend, Dr. Joy Leary here, who we will no longer call doctor anymore. I got that lecture in the email early on, um, but wanted to have a conversation today with you about um, you know, how advisors are always comparing ourselves to other advisors, whether that's what they're doing from content, what their businesses look like, and how ultimately that comparison can be detrimental to our growth as advisors and our brand. Um, but before we get to that, I want you to introduce yourself to everybody because in, when we first met, I started to do my research to figure out who you were. You're friends with, you know, Dr. Crosby and Brian Portnoy. So I know you're in good company, but I, I, you have been around for a while, but I hadn't heard your name until recently. So I don't know if everybody tuning in might know you yet. So give us a little bit about your background and who you are and what you do, and then we'll dive into the topic today. Absolutely. Well, it is great to be here with you this morning, Justin. I'm in California, so it is still morning here. Nobody's taken their lunch break yet, um, but it's an honor to join you. And I know that I am in good company in your community because you've worked really hard to just surround yourself with high caliber people. I really believe that we, um, who we surround ourselves with says a lot about us. And there's something, and we'll get into this today, but we, when you show up who you are authentically, you naturally have a magnetic pull for people who are probably fairly similar to you. And mm -hmm. I think that's why it's so important to be authentic. So I, I trust that the people who are gravitating toward you just share your heart and share just the standard of excellence that you hold for your work and how you move through your life. Well, so, thank you. I, I, I hope they do as well. And I, I know a lot of them, obviously, and I would say that they're all high quality people. So um, you're, I, I think you're right. But tell us, tell us about you first. So, so um, you know, what is it, what is your role in this whole, you know, FinTwit community and in the finance world? I know you're where, you know, I think finance and Freud meet is I think is what you said. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So I am a licensed clinical psychologist by training. So my, I have a doctorate in clinical psychology. So I am on the people side of the house. So my training did not start with the math or the economics, but I really, really under, I came throughout my clinical career to have a very deep understanding and appreciation for how emotionally electric money is in people's lives. It is something that is immutable, the impact it has. It's our relationship with money as humans. This is not something we get to opt out of. It's not something we can on, click an unsubscribe button. And I think we can understand a lot about human behavior. I think money is kind of this canvas on which a lot of personality function is splashed. So time and time again, in my clinical career, it really stood out to me over and over how regardless of what a present, regardless of a presenting concern, which is kind of shrink speak for what is the first thing people are telling you is wrong when they come through the door. Their financial lives became part of the picture. It is no surprise to anyone that even before this wild experience and roller coaster ride of 2020 began, that financial stress was something that was keeping people up at night and causing significant stress in their lives, discord in their relationships, long before we there was even the emotional up economic fallout of just been amplified since then. 
So that, that was very clear to me in my clinical work. And it's been really exciting for me to be able to now transition into the world of finance because we are seeing more than ever. And I think advisors are really starting to understand that the future of financial services is not just financial services, it is psychology. And I think there's a real need now for advisors to be able to understand, okay, how do I marry my training, my plan, the value I know I can bring with understanding the complexities of human behavior to best help and serve my clients. So I'm a little bit, I've, I've transitioned to this role of being a little bit Wendy, Wendy Rhodes for the real world, mm -hmm. but there are two sides of what I'm really passionate about doing. And I think first that is helping advisors become their strongest selves. Mm -hmm. I often hear there's so much overlap between being a therapist and being an advisor. And I think that's true because the conversations that clients are coming in to your offices having are in some ways very similar to those that they may be speaking to a therapist about. They're talking about deep personal issues. They're having discussions about things that they maybe aren't talking about with anyone else in their lives. Mm -hmm. So understanding how it, there are some unique challenges that are inherent in those kinds of relationships. So how can advisors make sure that they are showing up as their best selves mm -hmm. to provide the best service that they can to their clientele? So that starts with your becoming stronger, more self-aware, more emotionally intelligent. So mm -hmm. I'll do coaching and consultation and specialize in psychotherapy with advisors to make sure that first you have your own house in order. Mm -hmm. But then the other side is helping you become a stronger business person by really being able to connect with clients on a deeper level, apply the, the philosophies and really where the rubber meets the road around behavioral finance so that you can then integrate and deliver that into your client experience to really set you apart. Because I really believe now more than ever that there is a lot of pressure on advisors to attract and retain clients. And now you have to offer something that they can't get through an app. And that's really the personal experience and that ability to connect, ask smarter questions, become a better listener, have the emotional intelligence to make yourself someone that no client will ever want to leave mm -hmm. because you are providing them with a connection that they believe they won't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And some of those things, some of those skills aren't necessarily innate or intuitive. So really looking at that and just helping organizations move to this place of more holistic planning. There's a lot in there that I can unpack that would basically throw my uh, kind of script of what we might talk about today away and we go down a different path. But one thing I did want to point out is now you are not a financial advisor, even though you right. work with us and you're a friend to us, you know, realistically, you are a prospective client um, to yes. some advisor, some other. And one of the things you said was that the, it, the value of the advisor going forward is going to move beyond just the financial planning, which is something that I really want to drive home through the podcast and my writing is that as advisors, we've got to, we've got to do more. We've got to move a little bit more into like, I don't know if you want to call it life coaching, but life planning and moving, like the numbers are part of it, but yeah. because the numbers are intertwined with so many other areas of people's lives, we need to be able to help and enrich those lives and other areas. And there's different ways that we can do that. You could decide that your way to enrich your client's lives might be along the way of health and wellness and incorporating that in, into the relationship or, you know, doing more life planning and figuring out, helping clients figure out what do they really want out of life and then building the plan to that as opposed to, 
well, everybody says you should retire one day and kids got to go to college. So those are my goals. Um, so I just wanted people I, like I, any chance I get to hammer home, especially to younger advisors, that we need to be looking at ways to do more than just crunch numbers. Because yeah. to your point, an app can crunch the numbers, but an app can't be there for somebody and be that emotional shoulder from time to time that they might need. Um, you have to provide more than math. Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to have a plan. People can get a plan everywhere. And quite frankly, no one is going to care about your plan until they have a strong sense that they can trust that you care about them, you hear them as a person. So that where that's where I think a lot of the work right now is, is mm -hmm. helping develop that side of the experience that you're delivering. Okay, I'm scrapping our brand talk. We'll work brand in towards the, the end. But honestly, I think that what's more valuable for people, for advisors to understand is what you just talked about. So how, how do we advisors make ourselves better equipped to help our clients on a deeper level? Because that's really going to move the needle for, for advisors businesses out there. We can have plenty of brand talk and why it's important. I think everybody is starting to understand that it's important. And we'll work in the comparison game. But I think that this, what we just stumbled upon here is, is more important and more meaningful. So let's, let's stay here. Let's talk about as an advisor, how do I do a self check? How do I make sure that I'm properly equipped to be able to help my clients through their stresses and their needs when it comes to doing more than just crunching numbers? So something I would encourage people to think about as you are going into a meeting, it can, it can be very easy. And I think it's, it's always important to be prepared. Mm -hmm. That is, it is going to go sideways and you're going to struggle if you have not done your homework and you don't know what you're talking about. However, when you go in with your own agenda and lead with that and kind of superimpose that on your client as though it is a one size fits all answer for everyone's life across the board. I, I think that is very, very risky. So going into any conversation, any encounter thinking about, okay, this is the message. This is what I want to be able to share. But first I have to pay attention and gather in the moment data about the person right in front of me. Mm -hmm. Because you need to be able to assess is how is this person going to be able to listen to, take in what I have to say, what I have to offer based on who they are and the context even of what is what just happened in the car with their spouse right before they came into your office. Mm -hmm. If they are coming in in a really emotionally hot place, their ability to even hear and process what you have to say is a lot. Mm -hmm. If they are coming in holding something really heavy related to a topic that you're going to start talking about, there's a lot of power in being able to create space to have that kind of conversation because before you are giving them what you believe is, is the brilliant solution or fix. Mm -hmm. And the truth is you will be able to better tailor what you are providing your client with if you better understand their individual context and situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in this, this is one criticism I have of behavioral economic theory. There's a lot of pathologizing people's behavior and patterns with money. This idea that we're misbehaving or people are irrational. I can tell you as a clinician that when you get enough context about someone's life and what's going on, on some level, what they are doing is maybe adaptive. It may not make sense when you don't have the full picture, but you have to be able to hold that in mind and then care enough to gather that information. Mm -hmm. So really not going in thinking about, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to say, but paying attention to what you're seeing in front of you and then based on that in the moment, 
information being able to respond in a way that's attuned to what you are hearing. So we need to wait to put on our fixer hats, you know, because as advisors, we want to solve problems. Yes. Um, and one thing I've learned through marriage is that you can't always solve every problems and not everybody wants the problem solved at that time. Yeah. So you have to listen. So take our fixer problem hat off, put our listening ears on. Um, but I, I, from an advisor standpoint, if we, if we put ourselves in our client's shoes, sitting across from us at the table, and I am, as the advisor, telling you something that is totally opposite from what you are telling me because I already had this preset agenda, I've got to imagine from a client that's pretty, it's going to be off-putting. And it might lead them to realize that my advisor has no idea who I am or what I'm doing and start to look elsewhere. Yeah. But if you, even if you have the agenda, like I send my agenda to clients before they come in so they can see what the topics are we're going to cover. Mm -hmm. They can put their concerns on it as well. I can prepare ahead of time. But if, if, if they come in, like my clients, they come in knowing there's an agenda, but then they see that I am listening and I hear them and I deviate from the agenda to address the main concern that they have, like that's relationship building 101. And that's only going to make that relationship stronger to your point of being to a point where clients will never think to leave us because they may not, they might not find somebody else out there who gets them like we do. Yes. Um, so they I, will be far more likely, Justin, to follow you back to your agenda if you aren't just blasting ahead on your own and leaving them behind. Mm -hmm. So think, think about that even in proximity and kind of emotional connection in that client experience. Like you need them with you. They need to stay in your vehicle or you've definitely lost them. Mm -hmm. So if there is a little bit of a detour, don't be afraid to take that. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, especially if, you know, I describe that sometimes people will kind of put up bubbles in conversations where they might put something out there and it's a little bit more personal and they're maybe testing, okay, how's this person going to respond? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times this is true in an advisory relationship, but just interpersonally in general, people, people start to get really uncomfortable, especially if they think, well, I don't, I don't know the right thing to say. Mm -hmm. We're really big on, I need the right thing. Again, I need the solution. And then you start to feel maybe scared or helpless. So I'm just going to avoid following that because I don't know the right thing. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. Going back to what you said, that's not what the person is looking for. Mm -hmm. They're looking for someone to listen and you can reflect back what you've heard. You can share, you know, when I, when I hear that within myself, I find myself feeling or thinking, um, those are, those are really powerful connection points, mm -hmm. um, that I think is important that people don't lose. So I'm going to go back to another that you talked about creating space. What does, what does space look like? Cause we're not taught this. This is not in the CFP curriculum. This is not in the sales training we get when we come out of college at the place that we're selling whatever product they want us to. Like this is, I mean, something that we, I think eventually learn, but what does space look like? How do we create it? How do you create space? So you start with telling yourself, I'm going to make a concerted effort, especially maybe in the beginning, to speak less and listen. Mm -hmm. And while you are listening, don't be thinking in your head, well, this is what I'm going to say next, or this is what I'm going to do next. I think that, that gets in the way of really being present with the person right in front of you. Mm -hmm. So just let it go where it's going to go, but be right here, right now. Make, keep your, you want to keep your ears open. You also want to keep your eyes wide open too. And it doesn't matter if this is digital, whatever it is, be paying attention to body language. What are maybe some signs and signals that someone is getting uncomfortable? The truth is our, our touch points of discomfort 
there's usually something there. There's a reason we are uncomfortable. And um, there's something underneath that. And that may be some gold for you as an advisor to kind of get at and dig. So even making an observational statement of, I just noticed X, Y, and Z when I said blank. Can you tell me about what was going on with you or what was going through your mind or what you were feeling at that point? Mm -hmm. So those, those are some things that can be powerful in the moment mm -hmm. to be really connecting on a deeper level with somebody. What about like, let's talk about space, like space itself, the room, the way we decorate our office. How does that impact our ability to help our clients and have them be more relaxed? Because Stereotypically, you know, financial planning firms or offices are very stuffy. It's very formal. You know, mine, I wanted to be the complete opposite. Like that's, that's a kitchen table I got from Target. I've got books. I've got art from my kids, paintings. And that, like, I wanted it to be very comfortable. And part of that was earlier in my career, I didn't have an office. I went to my client's houses. So all of my meetings were centered at the, the kitchen table. Um, so does that matter to, to somebody coming in? Does it matter the, the environment that they're walking into? And should advisors really reconsider, you know, okay, if you want your stuffy old school office, make your office that way, but make the meeting room more comfortable, put people at ease. Absolutely. And I think this is where branding really comes in. I think your space and even how you are now virtually visibly showing up says a lot about you. So Think about what is my space? What is my visual presence communicating? Mm -hmm. And then the other side of that is, okay, how can I use my environment, my space to connect with the people that I'm hoping to work with? So think about demographics. Think about how are they decorating their homes, their houses? What are spaces they like to hang out? And um, so yeah, even put kind of an interior design hat on what is going to be visually attractive. Mm -hmm. The truth is we are wired as very sensory human beings. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of power in what we see, what we're hearing, um, even what we smell, textures, those kinds of things are really, really powerful in creating an experience. And so I don't believe that there's one right, right way to have your office set up, mm -hmm. but think about where will you be more, more, most comfortable? Mm -hmm. What is reflective of you? And then what, who are the clients that you want to attract and make sure that this is a space they really enjoy being in? Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by like the tech space and direct to consumer brands and the way that they market and brand themselves because it's very much to their audience. So you think about the stereotypical tech company, you go into their home, their headquarters, they've got ping pong tables and you know, beanbag chairs. And it's very relaxed. And like, that's that vibe. And we still are old school stuffy, not very warm environment. And I, I think that, you know, thinking about the businesses of the future, can we steal a little bit from those other areas and make yeah. our business more relatable, more comfortable, more trusting, um, and little things like that matter. Um, Trust is huge. And if the truth is, if you are providing an environment that's not super sterile, it, people are going, if people are more comfortable in your space, in your interactions, you will get more value. They will more likely open up, feel more at ease. And again, you will then get more data and information from them. Mm -hmm. And the more your client is willing and able to disclose to you about who they are at their core, the more value you are going to be able to provide them. Mm -hmm. So that means you've got a better shot at creating a client for life if you can connect on that deeper level. As we were talking about this, I just had a, a, a client pop in my mind. And then we'll move on from like the actual space, both the you know, the emotional space and the opportunity to talk within the, the office space. I had a client that every time we would meet, she would end up crying. And just money was a big stressor for her. And she's worried. And when I launched my firm and they ended up coming over, they came to my new office building, which is 
it's an office suite building. It's very artsy. There's nothing like, I love it because it doesn't feel like you're walking into an office building. That meeting, when we transferred everything over, which was a big deal she was nervous about, was the first meeting she didn't cry. And she actually said that she felt comfortable and at ease coming into the building. Now, I don't know if the old buildings and everything else before made her uncomfortable, but it was, it was, it was interesting. So I just share that because we're, we're talking about it here that, you know, when we think about the client experience, we think about our planning software and client portal and the communications, but part of the client experience, which will differentiate us and strengthen relationships, may be the setup of the, where we work from. Um, let's continue down the path of advisors putting ourselves in a better position to help our clients on a deeper level. Um, I think this is the appropriate time to bring up my favorite quote from your visit to the AGC this week, where you said advisors have to put their own oxygen masks on first. So back in the day when we used to fly, you got that warning. If we have turbulence and then it comes down, put your mask on before you help your kids. Same, same thing. And I, I love that because it made total sense. And we were talking about, you know, the stress that advisors bear as just individuals, you know, we have families, we have businesses, but then we are almost kind of like therapists sometimes. And during stressful times like COVID, our clients are stressed and they come to us stressed and then we bear their stress. Yeah. So what, what do you mean by put your oxygen mask on first and just go where you want to go with that? Okay. Everybody's heard that. And maybe on some level, it sounds simplistic or trite, but I think sometimes the simple things in life are some of the most difficult to execute, but have the most potential for helping us really up-level our lives mm -hmm. if we actually put them into practice. I kind of, I'll be honest, I don't love this term self-care. It sounds kind of soft. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there are a lot of misnomers about what that is. What does it mean to really take care of yourself? No, I, I'm sorry, this is not about putting nail polish on or going, going out to the beach. It's self-care, I really believe, is about self-preservation. And I like to talk with people about this idea of what are the practices you need to institute and judiciously protect, protect on a consistent basis in your life so that you can be a peak performer. Mm -hmm. And I think within this industry, like there are smart driven people who, who want to experience optimized success in their work, but in also other spheres of their life. But you have to have the habits and behaviors in place first in order to show up as your best self in the office, mm -hmm. at home, in all of these areas. So, and some of that, we start with the simple. So I will walk with people through every day, do an inventory of eat, sleep, move. Everyone can remember those three words, eat, sleep, move. How are you fueling yourself? What are you doing for physically, physical movement? And what, where is your sleep at? I think sleep is of paramount importance when it comes to performance and psychological and physical well-being. And people do not give enough stock or, or work hard enough on even that piece alone in their life. I mean, if I told you and your audience at the, at the end of our time, you can visit a website and I have a pill for you. And this pill is going to likely elongate your life it's going to make you, it's going to improve your concentration. It's going to improve your memory. It's probably going to help you curb cravings, enhance your metabolism. This is going to likely help you prevent cancer, diabetes, reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's. People, it's going to help you reduce your anxiety. You're probably going to be happier if you take this pill. Like people would be willing to pay a pretty penny for that. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've got news for you. Free. <laughs> the, the script from the doctor for you, the RX for all of those things is really healthy sleep. So it's starting mm -hmm. with those kinds of things. 
But I think also moving and having a mentality of, and this is where I go with the putting yourself first. In having these practices in your life does not make you selfish or self-indulgent. They are what you are doing so that you can show up how you want and you can best care for the people in your life mm -hmm. and really, really be meeting your responsibilities in the best way that you can. So it's important to give yourself permission to consistently protect those things. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of work we need to do on kind of flipping, flipping the script around, around this topic, because mm -hmm. it is so important. Um, you know, these practices of peak performance, it, it's, there are micro habits and they are macro habits in our lives. So it's, flossing your teeth, but it's being willing to say no to things that you don't actually have time for, that you don't want to do, that are just going to be a drain and further deplete you. Um, so the truth is, if you want to build the business and practice that you want and, and say sustainable in the long term, these things have to be in place and they have to remain over and over again. And we won't go too far into sleep, but you said there's a very important adjective you put with sleep, healthy sleep. Yes. Um, and, and I'm bad at that. So like I've read, like, you know, it's better to sleep. If, if you really, really wanted to get your sleep zoned in, you know, it's cooler room, blackout curtains, no screen for an hour beforehand, you'll know, put your phone in the other room. And my alarm is my phone. So like, I'm, I'm bad about it, but um, like there's like getting sleep is one thing, but then if you really want to take it to the next level, investing in your sleep and doing these other things makes it even better. And, you know, a lot of like the people, everyone listening to this is probably fairly intelligent. Mm -hmm. You could spout off to me all the right things to do. And this is, this is human nature. We talk about this in finance all the time. It's the knowing doing gap. Mm -hmm. And what really stand, there are multiple things in people's lives that stand in the way of the knowing and doing. And this is true of money and this is true of health habits. Um, we stand in that gap. We get in our own way. The people around us in various ways kind of get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. And also our environment, both things that we have control over and how our environment is set up and kind of the architecture of the world we live in also makes that, it creates more of a divide. So being aware of that, mm -hmm. it, but making a commitment to working to understand and address those things so that you can make the leap to the doing and application. And when it comes to sleep, you know, this can be a, this, this can be a clinical issue too. So if you are having issues, yes, go through that checklist of the standard sleep hygiene things that most people, most people tell themselves. But even if after checking those boxes, you are continuing to struggle, that's something to be speaking, you can speak to a professional about. There are more behavioral interventions. I think I'm not going to go beyond my scope of practice and talk about medication, but what you don't want to do is kind of create a band-aid fix for an mm -hmm. underlying issue. So, mm -hmm. so eat, sleep, movement is our easy checklist day to day. Uh, as we're moving through and we're trying to take inventory of how we're processing everything, what are what are warning signs that maybe? we're not doing a good job processing our own personal stresses or these added stresses from our clients. Um, like what, how do we know we might need to be talking to somebody or looking for help that, cause we're probably going to make excuses for why these things are happening, which maybe they're telling signs that, Hey, we need, there's something bigger going on that we need to pay attention to. Yeah. 
Well, I think you can start with that, with your body. Our bodies are inextricably linked to our brains, to our, our emotional functioning. And I think a lot of times people's bodies, when there is, when your body is in a, an elevated stress state for a prolonged period of time, which it was not designed to do, your body will start to whisper to you. You may start to get sick. You may, your, your sleep maybe is disrupted and disturbed. That in and of itself can kind of be a signal that your, your brain and your psyche is trying to get you attention, get your attention. You may have changes in weight, appetite. Um, pay attention to what your body is telling you because if you do not listen to it and then respond when it is whispering, it will start screaming and you don't want to wait for that to happen. I think the other thing to do is to really pay attention to your mood. What is your level of anxiety? Are you, are you finding that you are having a difficulty kind of on hooking from certain thoughts? You're preoccupied thinking about oh, I said the wrong thing. I wish I would have done this. I need to do this. If you find your thoughts really spinning and reeling in the past or in the future, and you have a hard time walking it back to right now, that's a sign. If someone starts to experience, and anxiety is, is this interesting beast because it's a very somatic experience, which means it involves our body, but it's also very emotional and has a lot to do with our thoughts. So um, if you start to experience panic symptoms, such as you're finding you're really jittery, on edge, racing heartbeat, just having a hard time settle, um, that's a sign things are going awry. If you're finding that you are wanting to sleep a lot, can't sleep at all, that's, again, this I can't foot stomp sleep enough. That's a big one. Um, I think sometimes the store we want to, it's human nature sometimes to want to avoid uncomfortable truths. And that's where kind of denial um, kind of takes over to try to protect us. And I think that's what you're speaking to. And I think one of the most powerful ways to protect yourself against that is to have relationships with people you trust, third parties who you can consistently check in with to provide you more of a 360 degree view of what they are observing. Mm -hmm. Because as humans, we don't always see or we really don't want to see our own reality. And there are things about ourselves that we, that are always going to be blind spots. So you are, you are really creating safety in your life. If you make sure you have enough people and voices who are looking, watching and making sure that you are showing up and staying in your lane. And then also being, so it's asking the questions and then being willing to listen to someone's concern, I think is really important. So this can be friends. It can be, I love the community group you're building. It can be groups of professionals. It can be family members, though sometimes hearing things from people with certain roles in your life, um, it can be hard to take in that information. But if, you're, if your partner is saying again and again, I'm, I've seen this, I'm worried, that's something to pay attention to. Um, and also, I really encourage people to be having a coach, therapist, whatever it is, someone with no vested interest with, in anything other than you being your healthiest self. So those are some of my thoughts about that. So to kind of tie all this part together, so we've, we've got the signs that maybe we're struggling. And if we're not addressing those, and we're not taking care of ourselves then we can't physically be at our top performance to help our clients. And ultimately we want to be doing everything we can to help our clients. So whether that be, you know, we're not catching 
our client signs about what's going on because we're distracted or our focus isn't good enough that we make an error in trading. Like there's some costly things that could happen if we're not taking care of ourselves. Um, safe to say that's, that's true. Absolutely. I, you know, I think paying attention, I like what you brought up about those little errors. If you find yourself doing things that previously, oh, I wouldn't have missed that or maybe scheduling an appointment at, at a wrong time, a double booking people, those kinds of things that are like, they happen and everybody understands that. Um, but just becoming overwhelmed by email, not responding to people. The, if that is a deviation from your, your baseline, that is a signal to pay attention to. Because what you don't want to happen is then to become so drained that you start to become apathetic mm -hmm. about that change in performance. Because that was where over time you are really going to see a decline in your business. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to finish with the, the brand talk, but before we head over and I have no smooth transition to get over there. Is there anything in closing about advisors taking care of themselves first to better serve and take care of their clients? Anything you want to end with on that before we hop over to another conversation? Well, I, I think it goes back to if, if you are telling yourself, this is important in my life, this is my goal, then having taking an honest look at what am I doing to move myself toward that place and how am I actually maybe getting in my own way? Mm -hmm. So we can say lots of things about what we want for our lives, our family, our health, our businesses, but talk is cheap where you really need to start to move the needle is in your behavior. Okay. All right, let's go talk branding. So this is where we were originally going to go. I, and part of the reason I was excited and I want to make sure we hit on this is you know, I talked to a lot of advisors and there's a lot of comparison. And my conversations a lot of times center around content and brand development. And, you know, I'm not creating as much as this person or this person's better than I am. And like it ultimately keeps these advisors who are very smart, and very talented from ever accomplishing their goal because they're too worried about other people. So yeah. In your work, you see the impact or you see the effects of us comparing ourselves to others. Like how much harm does that cause beyond the obvious, like going deeper? What's the harm behind it? Absolutely. I think there's a real psychology behind this. So, and this isn't just true in the world of finance. Like right. this is all humans. We are wired to compare, but I see this really really having a negative impact on business when you start to look around and tell yourself, well, that person is doing that thing. That means maybe I should be doing that. Or that person is doing that thing. Maybe that's what I need to do. And yes, there, there is something to be said for looking and having models for what works. But where this starts to break down is when people tell themselves, I need to do something or become someone else mm -hmm. that is not genuinely authentic with who they are. Mm -hmm. So first, in order to do that, you have to have a deep understanding of who you are, your why, your motivation. And then you have to give yourself permission to show up as that person. Mm -hmm. And that is a very difficult thing to actually do because it requires a lot of courage. I think there are, and there are things that this is deeper stuff in, and this isn't just me being a psychobabble shrink, but if we think about it, if you are one trying to please everyone which I think a lot of people, especially early starting out is, okay, I feel the pressure of the business. I need to be all things to all people. You actually water yourself down so much that you aren't serving anyone well. Mm -hmm. And people are hardwired and some people struggle with this more than others to please. As humans, we don't like to not be liked. Mm -hmm. 
when I meet with a client for the first time, I, I, I start out of the gate saying, I may not be your cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And it's really important that we actually figure that out early on because you aren't going to be able to do the work that you are coming here to do if we are not connected, if this is not a fit and, and it's a waste of time and resources on both sides if mm -hmm. we're trying to pretend. Mm -hmm. So, but that requires me being comfortable with some people being like, you are not my thing. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. The, you know, I think so many people have this, have this false belief of, I need to be liked by everyone. The earlier people in their lives and careers can become comfortable with not being liked by everyone, which is in, in itself an impossibility. The more space and energy you have to then become who you are and the more authentic and real you are, then you are really going to have that magnetic pull I talked about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But you can't be afraid to not be everybody's favorite. Mm -hmm. And I think that really gets in the way. I, I lived what you described. So when I started my firm, I had different paths and I was looking at people that I looked up to and, and taking people's opinions to try to figure out, you know, what am I going to be? And like, I, if you go back over my writing and my content, you know, there was a time I was going to have a lifestyle practice. And then I wanted to be a CEO of a bigger firm. And like, I was just trying to find my way. And then ultimately I did. Um, so I, you know, I just wanted to share that you don't have to know it right away. And sometimes it takes some time to figure it out. And sometimes you have to try some different things to, yes. to get there. Um, and the other thing try I was going to say, what you described should sound very familiar to this audience. You didn't use the word, but you basically described the benefit of having a niche within your, your practice. You, yes. you know, whether that niche is a mindset or it is, you know, a, a profession or whatever it might be, you know, that allows you to be everything to some, but not something to everybody. Yeah. Um, and if we talk about community building, I'm really, really big. I, and this is, um, this is the, so much of the ethos that I just really appreciate and respect about you is people in business and in life get farther faster if they are being collaborative. Mm -hmm. So if you get comfortable with who you are and then know who you're not, when you have a client coming in who clearly isn't a good fit, you can think of, okay, I know who is. Let me connect you with that person. Mm -hmm. That's going to bring value to that person. They are going to remember that. And then they're, they're going to think of you as well. And again, that's not a, I'll do this for you. You do this for me. No, that's, that's building trust. Mm -hmm. And they're in business. There's so much power in trust. Mm -hmm. And then I think there, and another thought I have related to this that I just really want to share that I think is important, especially for people starting out, but even further in their career, um, this idea of, well, there's always someone who's better at what I'm doing. They're more successful. Um, and so why even try? The truth is maybe things have been done similarly before. Maybe, maybe the same things have already been said, but no one can say it with your voice. And there is someone out there for everyone. So having the courage to really connect to and use your voice, I, I think is so important. Um, because if you are not showing up doing your work as you, that in the way you were placed in this universe to do, there's going to be someone who needs you who's going to miss out. Mm -hmm. to hold on to that. You know, you and I had a conversation earlier about this idea of imposter syndrome and I, and maybe that's another conversation for another day, but I do think that's another important thread of this, this idea that, um, I, that I'm not good enough, or there's always someone better, or someone's going to find out that I'm, 
not as good as I want to be, or they think I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let everyone listening right now in on a dirty little secret. I have spent years and years and years sitting behind closed doors with very accomplished professional individuals, the people you see on the nightly news, just CEOs, executives, and they've come in and they've had conversations with me that they haven't had with anyone else. And they experience success on the outside that, that the world looks at and praises. But the truth is, and I think this happens a lot with peak performers, a lot of people struggle with this idea of, well, am I a fraud? Am I this good? Am I going to be found out? And I, there are, I see a couple of, a couple of pieces that contribute to imposter syndrome. One can be a sense of insecurity, but that is important to address. But also, I think it comes from a place of genuinely caring about providing quality to the people you're serving. Mm -hmm. And that's admirable, but it's just important to keep that in check. Because if you are worried about not being good enough, that says to me, you have a desire and motivation to do a good job. So let's help you do that by having a little bit more grace with yourself and, and just know, I think it be, can be helpful for everyone to keep in mind. I think with all peak performers, everybody feels like an imposter at some, at some point. And I think, especially now it is crystal clear in 2020 on some level, everyone's just kind of making it up as they go. <laughs> so I think when you can, when you can tell yourself that narrative, it gives you more courage and freedom to maybe do an experiment with some things that maybe you would have been afraid to try before that could actually do huge, huge things in your life, in your business. I have, I have one more question before we get to the final question. So, you know, we're true with ourselves. We figure out who we are, what path we're going down. Are we allowed to change that path? Do we have a, do we have permission to be able to realize, okay, the path that I went down for 15 years was the right one at that time, but life experiences, goals, and things have changed. I'm, you know, I'm being called to go this other direction. Is that okay? Or do we just keep plowing ahead? No, I think that's so important. And you know, I've been having conversations with, I know Brian Portnoy has been doing a lot of thinking about this. And even it's something that Morgan Housel brought up in his book that I really appreciate is we can, we can think about or imagine this is what I'm going to want during the season of my life, but we don't really know until we get there. So I'll use the experience. I'll use my own experience of, I have, twin, almost three-year-olds. And I knew going into that experience, I had this idea of what I would probably want my work home configuration to look like. Mm -hmm. But I knew that becoming a parent would change me in deep fundamental ways that I wouldn't know until I was there. Mm -hmm. So then I gave myself permission to really assess where I was at. And I was on target with what I had been anticipating, but telling myself, okay, I can decide when I get there. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's, I, I think there's an edge to this. And this is where kind of knowing yourself, your personality, if you're someone who just kind of jumps in and out of things and struggles with inconsistency, there needs to be some structure to staying with something long enough to know if this pivot this pilot that you're running is going to work mm -hmm. or if you need to say juices i i'm going to drop this um but giving yourself permission to make it, our lives are not our lives don't go like this our lives go like this mm -hmm. and as we move through them we're changed by our experiences so really giving yourself permission to go where your passion is and having the courage to change um, and find your own path. Because if you are genuinely on, your, on the place where you can be your best self, you will do your best work. 
I like it. So let's get to the final question. Does everybody get the same question? Um, so it ties back into branding. So we got a little bit of branding in there. Uh, but the question is the, the essence of branding is something that you see, believe, or feel that is your unique lens in terms of how we see the world or our profession. So like, what's, what's the one thing that you believe or see that you think the majority of your peers or other people are missing? What's, what's your unique perspective that separates you from everybody else? I, I am a really big believer, and this is, this is not just in business, but this for me is about life. And the idea of living like you are living on borrowed time living like you're living, like you are living bonus rounds. Mm -hmm. And my husband is in the military. So we've had experiences as a family and I've had experiences in my own life where it's really, really brought me, it's given me a front row look at if, if today was my last day. Mm -hmm. And the truth is none of us know what is going to happen about happen tomorrow but if today was my last day how would I want to live it I think so often people play it safe in their lives and they stay back and they avoid doing things they avoid having conversations they leave things left unsaid undone that in retrospect there's real potential to have regret about mm -hmm. in life we are hindsight is always going to be 2020 and there will be regret but I think really approaching approaching your decision making process with with the information I have at this time what what how how do I really want to be intentional about the choices I'm making is something that I think is huge I'm writing something down right now because as you were talking about that, so what you described, I, I think it embodies like the life planning process. If you read anything from George Kinder, he talks about building lives and figuring out what you really want and, and going after it. And we rebranded the firm that that's the type of planning that I want to do going forward. And if you go to our website, like the, hopefully the message that comes across is we want to, I say dreamers, the people who don't want to write, they don't want to live by society's norms, they want to write their own story. But what I really loved about what you said, and I'm going to, work into some of the language about who we help and how we help is I want the planning that we do to help our clients avoid regrets. And yes. I want to, I want to help people avoid playing it safe, like not be crazy and be stupid, right. but don't, don't play it safe your whole life and then have those regrets. So that's what I was jotting down. Like that's going to be, that's going to find its way, way somewhere into my language, whether it's website or blog post or how I describe the work that we do. That's, that really resonated with me. So I, I like that. I'm so glad, Justin. Um, well, as we conclude, let everybody know where they can find you. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes on the website. It'll be in the YouTube notes as well. But where can we find you, learn more about you, and keep up to date with all the great research you're doing? Absolutely. So feel free to visit my website. Um, J -O, my, it's my name, just Joy Leary, J-O-Y-L-E-R-E.com. I also have a blog there. Um, you can reach out to me. Uh, one of the best ways to contact me directly, particularly if you're interested in working together, I work with people individually and also provide consultation to teams is my email. So um, Dr. Leary, D-R-L-E-R-E at joyleary.com. I also enjoy hanging out on Twitter. Um, my handle is at joyleary.psyd, so P-S-Y-D. Um, same for Instagram. Sometimes I will spin my creative wheels there. And also I'm active on LinkedIn. Um, just search my name, Joy Larry, and my degree side. I will link to all those except for your email. I don't want you getting a bunch of spam email. They can find that through your website. But Joy, I appreciate you taking the time with us this morning on your part over lunchtime here on the East Coast um, and having this conversation. And thank you for being flexible enough to go off script and talk about something else before we got to the plan combo. I, this, we gave a demonstration of exactly what I was talking about and the power in doing that. Uh, I didn't even intend that. That was awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Show notes will be over at justincastelli.io slash blog. You can subscribe to the newsletter there as well. Uh, be sure to go follow joy and keep up with everything she's doing. 
and we'll see everybody in the next episode. Thank you, Justin. Always great to chat with you. Bye, Joy.